Hi, I'm Tony. Welcome to Sports Bike Shop's Shubathy 2 Helmet Review. When Shubath released their C5 flip front helmet, it was inevitable that we would soon see this, the E2. Shubath have done it before by tweaking their C3 Pro touring helmet and adding a peak to make the E1, and now they've done it again. E stands for Enduro, and this is essentially a C5 with a more adventure and off-road style and performance, which is thanks mostly to the addition of the peak. The outer shell on this helmet, it's made from Shubath's combination of fiberglass and carbon fiber, and the chin bar portion is made from plastic. Now, before anyone gets worried about that or thinks that that's a criticism, it's perfectly normal for the chin bar on a flip front helmet to be made of plastic, even if the main head parts shell is made from composite fiber. We weighed this size medium E2 on our scales and it came in at 1868 grams. That's 180 grams more than a C5 and the peak alone weighs 160 of those extra grams. That overall makes this one of the heaviest helmets we've tested but I didn't find it to be an issue on the road as the weight distribution actually feels pretty good. The chin bar on this helmet lifts with a button on the bottom edge and the peak lifts with it as it travels to the raised position. There's a small switch on the left that locks the chin bar up which then makes this helmet legal to be worn in the open position while riding. The E2 is dual homologated so it's tested as an open face in this configuration and also as a full face when the chin bar is closed. I found it fine to ride with the chin bar up. The balance was perhaps very slightly front heavy but it was nothing problematic. If you unlock the chin bar on that switch and then pull the chin bar back down, it closes it. It's worth noting that it's best to grip the chin curtain as it drops, otherwise this might fold up against your chin rather than folding underneath it. When you lower the chin bar, the peak returns to the position it was in before you opened the helmet. There's a reassuring click as well as the chin bar locks into place again. The peak isn't the only thing that remembers where it was before you opened the chin bar. The visor does the same. So if you have the visor open, even just by a little bit, when you lift the chin bar, that will return to exactly the same visor position when you close the chin bar again. The peak, as I've probably just suggested, is adjustable for height. Releasing these latches on the bottom edge of the peak mean you can then choose from three height positions. I found it to intrude on my vision with the peak sat in its lowest position, but it is very good at shielding the eyes when riding straight into very low sun with it in that setting. In the highest position, I couldn't even see the peak in my line of vision, which does make me wonder why I'd need it at all. But if you just want the peak out of the way, like when the sun's high in the sky, this is the place to put it in the highest position. I find the middle position gives a good balance of glare protection without restricting my forward vision too much. If you want to take the peak off completely, it's easy to do that and you can ride in this helmet without the peak. Shubath supply two blanking covers that clip into the holes where the peak would otherwise be, which helps smooth the airflow over that part of the lid when you're riding without the peak. Taking the peak off does eliminate any issues you get with aerodynamics. I didn't notice any problems with the peak moving my head backwards or forwards in the wind flow, which is something that can happen with peaked helmets like this. I didn't suffer neck ache and I wouldn't expect to either over long periods. There is some free play in the peak's mounting mechanism and I could see the tip of the peak fluttering in the breeze when I rode either with the peak in the middle or the low position. Couldn't see it at the top position because you can't even see the peak. I could also hear a squeaking noise from the peak in all three of those positions as it moved about. I think that movement helps keep my head still and I'd prefer the peak to move and for my head to stay in position rather than having it the other way around. The fluttering movement and squeaking noise personally are a price that I'd be happy to pay for having better stability, but some owners mention it as an issue when they leave their customer reviews for their E2. Right, let's cover ventilation. This is one of the strongest aspects of the E2. There are two vents at the chin which both work exceptionally well in my experience. The one nearest the visor rocks forward and back, and when it's open, it scoops plenty of air into the eye port and onto the inner surface of the visor. The lower of the two vents slides down and this also lets lots of air through around your mouth. There's a filter in there as well that stops bugs getting through and that filter can also be cleaned or replaced over time. The top slider vent has two positions. You get half open or fully open and this also brings through a decent amount of air. If the venting performance is all a little bit too much and it might be for some, there's a flap in the top pad of the comfort liner which you can fold over to block that vent inlet completely. Once air comes in, there are channels in the EPS impact liner that allow that air to circulate and then it can be pulled out through exhaust vents. 
at the rear of the helmet. Shubath also say some of that air can circulate to the lower rear portion of the helmet and also escape there too. However it works, ventilation on this helmet is excellent in use. Okay, let's move on to the visor. In most practical senses, it's the same as the one on the C5, but it's been adapted to allow a peak to fit to the helmet. It's got an excellent change method. There's a link to our how-to video in the description for this video, and it takes six steps from fully open to fully closed. There's a city position, which gives around a 10 millimeter gap between visor lip and helmet seal. When you first open the visor using either the left or right tab, because you've got one of each, you might go a little bit further up on the first push, but then sliding it back down will put the visor into the city position. I found this to be good for getting in a decent amount of air to freshen up the interior when riding at low speed. We also gave this helmet out to one of our contributing reviewers who wore the E2 for several hundred miles. He said the visor would stay open in the intermediate positions at a range of different riding speeds, and I know that's something people like to know about a helmet like this. He was very positive about this helmet in general, and there's a link in the description for this video that will take you to his written review in case you'd like to read that in full. The anti-mist insert for this helmet is a top grade Pinlock 120, and it's one of the wider inserts around, which improves peripheral vision. Overall, I found vision from this helmet to be excellent. If I have a criticism in this area, it's really only that the only way to adjust the tension of the Pinlock is to push the pins out and then push them back through in a different position, which is a faff. Something I feel I need to mention as well is a problem we experienced when we reviewed the C5, and I'd expect that same problem to transfer to the E2 as the design hasn't been revised in this way. Our C5 was so well sealed against rain and noise that significant condensation built up on the inside of the visor when I rode in bad weather. In time, that moisture crept over the pinlock seal and it got onto the inner surface of the pinlock itself. So if you're riding in sustained rain or planning to, then I'd be prepared to stop after an hour or maybe an hour and a half to wipe that moisture off the inside of the visor. There's an internal sun visor with this helmet. It's got a good amount of drop, but if you find it comes down too far, there is a limiter on the slider switch that reduces the visor's drop by around eight millimeters. I found that some visor had good enough coverage while I was riding, though for me, it's a shame there's no anti-fog coating as I found it would mist up on damp mornings. The visor vent, the top of the uppermost of the two, brings through some air to help clear it and the city position, having the visor open that little bit, definitely brings in enough to sort that misting. That's not ideal if it rains as water can then get inside the main visor. But then no one in the 17 customer reviews of this helmet has even mentioned a misted sun visor, so maybe that's just my issue. Okay, let's go inside the E2. The comfort liner is the same as you'll find in the C5. It comes in eight parts, which allows more customization than you get with most helmets. As well as two cheek pads and a neck roll, there are five pads for the skull. That's a front pad, a back pad, a top pad, and two sides. If your head is either a medium, a large, or an extra large, then you can tweak the thicknesses of those back and side pads to suit your head shape. There are three padding kits available from Shubath to convert the fit from standard to suiting either round or long heads. Round kits have a thicker back pad and thinner side pads to accommodate a broader head, and then long kits have a thinner back pad and thicker side pads to suit a longer head. As we record this, those kits cost £37 each. There are four thicknesses of cheek pad available as well, which gives a lot of options all round for tweaking the fit. You can go up or down in thickness by five millimetres from the thickness of the standard cheek pads, and a pair of replacements is £63 as we record this. The liner is comfortable in my experience, and it's also good at managing moisture. The fact there are eight parts makes it this a bit fiddlier than normal to fit, but that's not really a big deal, as it's not something you're going to be doing every five minutes. Now, while we're showing you the lid with the lining out, you can see inside another Shubath feature, which is the anti-roll-off system. The straps that extend from the chin strap to the back of the helmet are designed to help it stay on your head when there are external forces that are trying to roll the helmet forward and off your head. The chin strap on this is a micrometric buckle, as it is on the vast majority of flip front helmets. Now, last bits with the padding, there's an additional wind deflector on the base of the chin bar, which keeps the ride quieter and blocks out drafts. It's only Velcroed in, so it's easy to take that out if you just want to let a little bit more air inside the helmet. And also, with the liner out, you can see that the E2 is already half fitted with a Shubath intercom. The speakers and three antenna 
are in place already. One for Bluetooth, one antenna for mesh, and then the third one for FM radio. If you slot a battery into the port at the rear of the helmet and then put a control module into place on the left side of the lid, you just plug in a microphone and you're fully commed up. If you want that, it's £330 as we record this for the SC2 system, which is a high-spec intercom that uses mesh and Bluetooth, and it's made by Senna for Schubert. On the whole, customers who've bought one of those SC2 units are pretty happy with it, and it does integrate very neatly into the helmet. If you want to fit an off-the-shelf intercom rather than that official Schubert one, it will be a bit difficult, but it's not impossible. I think it's easier than on some helmets, as at least the clip-on cover here is completely flat, which means you can use a self-adhesive pad to stick the control module for your intercom on there. Okay, let's move on to sizing, approvals and pricing. The E2 comes in sizes from extra small up to triple extra large. There are two shell sizes. Helmets from extra small up to and including large go in the smaller shell, and then extra large and above go in the bigger of the two shells. There are various thicknesses of EPS impact liner as well, so Schuberth aren't just padding the same size of interior out with thicker comfort foam to make it fit smaller heads. The E2 is approved to the latest road standard, which is ECE 2206. There's no rating from the UK government's Sharp Impact Testing Programme as we record this, and I'd say it's unlikely there will be one because Sharp doesn't test helmets with peaks. But if they change that policy and release a rating for the E2, we'll add that info to the description for this video. There's no ACU gold rating, so the one person in 10 million who might want to use this on a track or in competition is sadly going to be disappointed. Okay, pricing. In plain white or plain black, the E2 is £539.99 as we record this. This concrete grey colour is £564.99 and in graphics the E2 is £614.99p. That's either £20 or £25 more than a C5, depending on the colour. Now that's not a huge leap up in price, so if you think a peak might come in handy on more than the odd occasion, it might be worth going for an E2 rather than a C5. It will keep your options open, as it's easy to run this helmet in street mode most of the time, effectively making it a C5. And then you'll also have the peak available to fit when you think it'll help. If you want to add a peak to a C5 instead, then it'll cost a lot more than 25 quid to do that, and that's assuming the peak becomes available as a separate item in the future, because it isn't at the moment. Overall, I think it's best to be honest about what this helmet is. I don't think of it as an adventure helmet in the sense of be it being a genuine crossover between a dirt helmet and a road helmet. It can be worn off-road, and Schubert's promo videos for this helmet do show some serious off-roading being done by riders wearing an E2. All of those promo shots show the helmet with the visor attached, even when those people are riding off-road. And the thing is, pretty much anyone serious about off-roading would generally wear goggles rather than a visor. You can run the peak on the E2 without having the visor fitted, and you can just about squeeze goggles into the eye port, but it's not great. And the chin bar definitely won't open if you've got a goggle strap in the way. So what is this in my opinion? I would say this is a touring helmet with a peak, and there is nothing wrong with that, as long as that's what you want. Peaks are good for shielding your eyes from the sun when it's low, and they bring a hint of adventure aesthetic for people who ride road-going adventure bikes. Again, nothing wrong with that. If you've had an adventure helmet in the past and you've never worn goggles with it, then let's face it, there's never going to be an issue at all with this helmet as you're losing absolutely nothing. I found the E2 to be a very good touring helmet when worn with the peak in place. I didn't find any big aerodynamic problems when I wore this helmet with a Suzuki V-Strom 800DE. The visible and audible fluttering of the peak didn't bother me, but I know it may bother some. I like a lot about the C5 that this helmet's based on, and adding a peak doesn't spoil the experience. Now, I know people are probably going to want me to talk about noise. I had no problems at all with the general noise from the E2, although I do always wear decent earplugs, and I'd also advise anyone else to do exactly the same. There is that low-level squeaking that I mentioned earlier from the movement of the peak, which I personally didn't mind. The customer reviews, though, suggest that some people will be bothered by it. I found overall the ability to easily whip the peak off when it's not needed means the E2 is a very impressive and very versatile choice of helmet. I hope that tells you everything you wanted to know about the Schubert E2, but if there is anything you'd like to ask or to add, then please pop a comment below. Thanks for watching.